Greetings. Welcome to our online worship services for St. Paul's Lutheran Church for the fifth Sunday in Lent. A special welcome to those of you anywhere around the world who are not normally part of our fellowship, but who are joining us online. We are grateful to be in fellowship with you across the distances. For all of your announcements for the week, uh, I invite you to look to our website and to our Friday email uh, for those points of interest that may affect you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray the prayer of the day. Holy One, your Son came into this world bringing salvation and life to all who believe. May your Spirit breathe life into the dry bones of our lives, so that we may follow and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading for today is from the 37th chapter of Ezekiel. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said. O sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, O oh, my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from the 8th chapter of Romans. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their mind set on what their, that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. 
It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who lives in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel for today is from the 11th chapter of St. John. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you are going back there? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by this world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Martha, Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. 
Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave cloths and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called the meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing? they asked. Here is this man performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Then one of them, named Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on they plotted to take his life. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning, boys and girls. A little while back, Froggy and I went to a museum. Froggy likes to visit museums. And we were walking around, and there was uh, an area with information about lots of different animals. And then we saw something that just made Froggy just shake. He was so upset. He was so scared. It was a frog skeleton. And Froggy has just always, when he saw a skeleton of another frog, just gotten very upset. Now, I tried to explain to him that he had nothing to be afraid of because of that skeleton, but uh, it just, it bothered him. It made him think of frogs that were dead and that someday he would be dead and, and the whole thing that just bothered him very, very much. In our Old Testament reading for the day, uh, we hear one of the most famous skeleton stories uh, in the whole Bible. Uh, we hear about a whole bunch of bones, those are and just skeletons that have fallen apart, just piles and piles of bones that uh, were laying there on the ground. And uh, a vision that the prophet had that uh, stirred up these bones from the word of God and and made them all come together and be able to stand up and uh, have muscles and flesh and then finally to to breathe again. And well, that that sounds a little bit like a scary zombie movie or something. That that's not a very happy sounding picture. Now, when when I was uh, a little kid, about the age of uh, those of you who normally come up at church for froggy time. Uh, skeletons of humans, oh, they scared me a lot. When I was uh, just starting school, there was a museum that we always visited. It was an old history museum. And this old history museum had an old doctor's office from like back around the time of the Civil War. And uh, in this doctor's office, there was this human, real skeleton that uh, just hung there by the wall. And uh, whenever we went there and I had to walk in that room, I just looked at that skeleton and I was just completely afraid. Uh, that just bothered me uh, for, for many, many years. There are lots of things in this world that we're afraid of that we really don't need to be afraid of. 
Um, skeletons and uh, dead bodies are among those things. Lots of people are afraid of them, but there's just no need to be. God assures us that if we believe in Jesus Christ and we are baptized, then there is nothing about death that we need to be afraid of. And in fact, there's nothing about life that we need to be afraid of. Now, there are still things in life that we need to be careful about because God wants us to use our heads and to think carefully and to stay safe. And so uh, when we go for a drive in the car, we put on our seatbelts, not because we don't trust God, but because God has given us things like seatbelts to help us stay safe. Lots of you are having to miss uh, your regular school or preschool or daycare or uh, coming to church and going to Sunday school and, and seeing other kids your age. And it, it probably seems a little odd. Now, some of you might be enjoying it. Some of you like having your parents in the house more and having more time to have them read you stories and things. But you may notice that it's stressful for them as well. In this life, there are lots of things that we have to be careful about. And your parents have been blessed by God to be able to teach you about those things that you need to be careful about. But we shouldn't live our life being afraid. Uh, afraid of pictures of skeletons or afraid of this uh, virus that is going around the world. We should be very careful around things that are dangerous, but we shouldn't be afraid because we know that God loves us and that um, there's nothing in this world that's more powerful than God. Even if bad things happen, we know that God will still always love and care for us forever. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. It's hard to believe here we are late in the month of March and just last month, February, uh, my wife Pam and I were in Spain making our way around the country. Uh, we drove a lot. We drove enough that I was able to get a speeding ticket, uh, in fact, on the Spanish highways. Uh, but we saw a, a whole lot of the country. Uh, so we started in Barcelona and went all the way down along the Mediterranean coast over to Gibraltar. And then after uh, a quick ferry ride uh, over to Morocco and back, uh, we then drove up through the middle part of the country uh, all the way up to uh, Avila and then eventually worked our way back east again. And so we, we saw a lot of Spain and uh, met many wonderful people, saw many old cathedrals and church buildings and historical sites. Uh, we didn't really spend much time in Madrid. We just drove kind of around and through parts of it. But uh, it's hard to avoid Madrid in the news this week because they keep showing that big ice rink downtown and that uh, the deaths from coronavirus have grown to the point where there's simply no place for the Spanish authorities to put uh, all of the dead bodies. And so the, the best they could come up with was to take uh, this giant ice rink and use it as a mortuary because of the ice that it already has in place. In our own country, uh, as I am uh, preparing this message during the week, uh, we have uh, just today passed the, the point of a thousand deaths from the coronavirus in our country. And if you allow yourself to get sucked into uh, too much of the drama on Facebook and the back and forth and, you know, you hear, well, but a thousand people died of this or 10,000 people died of that. And, and uh, the, some of those statements are factual, uh, but they don't change the fact that uh, this is something new that's killing people. 
uh, a brand new virus and we still have the regular flu that's killing people and we still have cancer and we still have heart disease and we still have uh, obesity that uh, contributes to all sorts of health problems and we still have people driving without turn signals which may be just as frightening and threatening and yet we don't get 24-hour news coverage about people driving without turn signals that are causing accidents. Uh, we don't get uh, governors calling out the National Guard to go out and find all those people that refuse to use their turn signals, even though we know they cause deaths and accidents every year. Why is that? Well, I suspect that... Uh, Generations to come will look back with uh, some ponderment and astonishment about uh, the smart things we did and the not so smart things we did and the ways that different people reacted in this time of crisis. But because it is indeed taking human lives, it is a, a troubling concern, should be a troubling concern for all of us. Death is a part of life, but death before its proper time uh, is always a grievous thing because our lives are incredibly precious gifts from God. God gives each of us life, gives each of us a particular span of days known only to God and not to us, and we are called to fully live and use those lives to whatever purposes God has created us for. And so, uh, whether it's a person that refuses to use their turn signal, or a disease like the flu that comes back every single year, or a one-of-a-kind uh, variation of the coronavirus, like this COVID-19, that um, we, at this juncture, still pray will be a one-time event, whatever it is that needlessly shortens the span of our days, is an affront to the creation that God has designed and placed us in. So we do well to do what we can to both protect ourselves and to protect our neighbors. Now this week's reading, uh, a couple of this week's readings, uh, certainly make the notion of death somewhat inescapable. We have uh, this powerful vision uh, from the prophet uh, Ezekiel uh, in the Old Testament of uh, the bones spread out in the valley and how they are rekindled. And all of that is uh, a teaching vision that was given to Ezekiel to give people hope for the restoration of Israel. But this teaching vision, uh, God reaching out to the prophet to fill the prophet with this vision, use such a powerful metaphor because death is something that all people uh, are touched by. And so uh, it was a, a very powerful image that God chose there. And then Jesus, in this powerful story of Lazarus being raised from the dead, it's very clear as we listen to the, the long recounting of the story and as it unfolds, that Jesus knew that Lazarus was dying, and that though Jesus loved Lazarus and Mary and Martha, and that uh, Jesus would weep eventually when he got to the tomb, as he was talking to his disciples, he made it clear that the timing of this, this death was to serve a purpose, and that the purpose that it was to serve was uh, to to be a, a witness and evidence for the disciples and those who were gathered. Now, the full lesson to be learned is a little more complicated, a little more multi-layered. Uh, on the one hand, it's just one of Jesus' super miracles. You know, it, it proves like uh, the feeding of the 5,000 that Jesus can do things that uh, no mortal man can do, that Jesus has these superpowers uh, that are an obvious sign of uh, the divinity that uh, he either possesses, does possess, as we know historically, or at least to the crowds, uh, the divinity that flowed through him, this supernatural power, 
Uh, either way, this was a person sent by God that people should pay attention to the words of. But beyond that, uh, you've got the, the time in the tomb and uh, the, the resurrection and all of that, which was a powerful foreshadowing of what was to happen to Jesus himself very soon uh, when he would be crucified. And at the, the very end of the story, uh, we have Caiaphas, uh, no friend of Jesus, uh, who nonetheless speaks what turns out to be uh, a word of prophecy to indicate uh, the death that Jesus would suffer on behalf of all of Israel. Uh, what we know in hindsight, it was that it was indeed more than all of Israel. It was all of humanity for whom Jesus Christ would die. But the thing that, that both of these powerful biblical stories draw together is the notion of death and conquering over death. And if death itself weren't so scary, these stories would not grip us and hold our attention as they do. I'm wondering how many of you have ever witnessed a death. In one of the uh, uh, keep yourself busy and entertain us uh, harmless things that have been going around Facebook, uh, there's some, some of these quizzes that uh, ask you to respond to a bunch of different questions. What What's your favorite kind of pie? Do you have any tattoos? Have you done this? Have you seen that? And, and those sorts of things. And, and uh, I, I participated in one of those for uh, one of the wonderfully cute little kids who used to come up for my children's sermons 20 years ago, who is of now, of course, uh, a grown-up adult, uh, all living independently on her own. And so she shared one of these quizzes. And uh, one of the questions on there is, have you ever watched a person die? And uh, that's something that not everyone has done. And uh, so I would ask each of you to reflect if that's an experience that you've had in your life. Uh, it's an experience that I've had numerous times. Uh, the first time, uh, first times were when I was doing my hospital uh, chaplaincy rotation unit as a, a part of seminary. So that was uh, 30 or so years ago. And then uh, throughout my pastoral ministry, uh, there have been uh, a couple of times where uh, I've been called to uh, stand a vigil with a family member uh, at the, the bedside as the person was dying. And those can be uh, very different experiences. Uh, I remember one family, it was a, a large family, and children, and grandchildren, and uh, brother, and sister-in-law, and just a, a huge crowd. The, the nurse had to keep controlling how many at a time could be in the room, that, that this man was just surrounded by uh, so many people who were there with him in his dying moments. And then I remember uh, another gentleman that, that I'd never encountered or uh, had any experience with in, in my life until uh, the morning I got a phone call very early from uh, a woman who was uh, a very active member of my congregation. And she would called me um, concerned and upset that uh, she had an uncle who had uh, no other... Uh, no children uh, of his own, no spouse, and uh, really no other family. And her uncle was dying, and she was uh, the contact person, and and uh, the hospital had called her, and she was just sitting there and wanted to know if her pastor could come be with her. So, of course, I went there and, and spent the day with Deb and with Deb's uncle and uh, waited throughout the day, slowly, as this man died. When I was a hospice chaplain for a brief while, overlapping, uh, doing some very part-time uh, interim ministry at a couple of churches, uh, there were numerous deaths that I was called to. And uh, I, I don't even remember anymore, having been through uh, a number of these, 
uh, all of the names and, and the faces of the folks that I have attended at the time of their death. But two years ago this week, uh, I certainly vividly recall that uh, my brothers and I uh, were called uh, to my father's hospital bedside, that um, he'd had a, a number of health problems that had escalated very quickly, and, and he was in the hospital, and the hospital uh, had moved him to a hospice unit, and, and all this happened over, rather quickly, over four or five days. And um, so we knew that the end was, was relatively near, but uh, he'd stayed up uh, late with my other two brothers uh, watching a, a college basketball game. And I'd gone back to his house to try to sleep. And, and they called me at uh, around a little past midnight. And, and I rushed back to the hospital. And, and it was still several more hours. And, but it was, it was painful. And painful memories. Because... Uh, sometimes death comes gently, and sometimes death uh, comes uh, haltingly, tragically, painfully, and it was much more the latter than the former. There's a good reason that we are given pause when we think about death. Because of the tremendous beauty and value of this life that we have been given on this mortal sphere, uh, it is good that we pause and remember to buckle our seatbelt and to use our turn signal and to keep our at least six foot social distance if we have to leave our house for some reason uh, during these challenging times. Uh, for all of those reasons, uh, it is good to hang on to the preciousness of this life that we've been granted. But don't forget the end of these two biblical stories. All right? it, it's more of a vision thing in Ezekiel. Don't, uh, don't get obsessed with what sounds like kind of a scary zombie apocalypse movie. But think of Lazarus. And Lazarus was the first, in many ways, of us who would be raised from the tomb. Of course, Lazarus was just raised back up to a natural life and eventually at some point uh, died again. But eventually, after that, uh, Lazarus, like all who die trusting in Jesus Christ, uh, then was able to see uh, his, his real, permanent, eternal resurrection. Doctors and nurses can do amazing things. Uh, our own church building here at St. Paul's has two defibrillators uh, put in strategic locations that a uh, person who knows what they're doing can bring a person back from death. What Jesus Christ does is on a completely different scale. Uh, as powerful as the work is that doctors and nurses do, all the time, particularly when they do so at, at compounded risk to themselves uh, during the time of COVID-19, uh, it, it is still an amazing thing that they do, that uh, the drugs and equipment uh, available to them, along with their, their passion to help and their specialized knowledge, uh, gives them the capability to literally snatch people back from death. But we, what we are talking about in the work of Jesus Christ is no temporary measure. Those who believe and trust in Jesus Christ, those who are baptized and live in that belief, are assured an eternal life. That means that death never has dominion over them. That means that uh, though they are called to be diligent in protecting this life and body that they have in this lifetime, that nothing ultimately can take away the life that awaits us in heaven. Powerful words. But of course, how do we get this, this magical, special, eternal thing? 
what, what a great system that builds that in. Two lives for one. We get this one where uh, we walk around and we see people and we drive our cars and, and we do those things. And then later we, we get the bonus one. Well, it, it's not exactly a, a grocery store kind of a BOGO deal. The only way that we can get this special deal was that someone had to suffer an amazingly, unbelievably high cost for us. And that was Jesus Christ. And so now as uh, we reach uh, the final Sunday in, in the regular Sundays of Lent, we will next week turn our attention to Palm or Passion Sunday and the events uh, that spark uh, the, that entire last week in Jerusalem, leading to that great, final, unimaginable cost that Jesus Christ bore that we might never have to fear death. Amen. together in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our service continues with the prayers. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. At the end of each prayer, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and either in the silence of your hearts or out loud, uh, I invite you to respond, hear our prayer. Most gracious God, we recognize that these are indeed uh, stressful and trying times for so many. We pray, first of all, for your hedge of protection uh, around all people, uh, that uh, they might avoid uh, getting, uh, suffering, and transferring this virus um, so that either they, their loved ones, or even strangers might be touched by it. We pray especially for those in healthcare professions and those in essential services that continue to make sure that we can buy food and that we continue to have uh, electricity and water and internet and all of those things that we count on for daily life. We pray your protection for all those people, Lord, who have to be out and about in the world. We pray also, Lord, for all those burdened by anxiety in this time. Uh, whether it is uh, the anxiety of uh, catching this virus, whether it is anxiety for our family members who have some sort of uh, compromised health situation that puts them at heightened risk, whether it is simply those, Lord, for whom uh, being closed up in their homes uh, pushes buttons in their lives, in their brains, that make them prone to anxiety or depression or to lashing out or to uh, yelling or even abusing a member of the household that they are closed in with. Lord, give us all protection, but give us all peace and calm uh, to endure these challenging days ahead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we realize that uh, this is not just a, a crisis confronting us. This is a crisis confronting the whole world. Uh, we lift up all of our brothers and sisters all around the world who are confronted by this illness. Uh, we wish to exclude no one, Lord, but particularly today I mention uh, the orphans in Tanaku and Gudapadu, India. Uh, I have been blessed to, to visit uh, both of those orphanages uh, on many occasions. Uh, I was uh, blessed to found the orphanage in Tanaku. Uh, and now, Lord, as India has gone on complete lockdown, and as so many households in India cannot go out and buy three weeks of food, uh, that they, they simply live day to day, uh, we pray, Lord, your provision, that all of those who uh, are locked in in India uh, will not starve, uh, will not run out of uh, safe drinking water, uh, that you would uh, keep safe both from the virus and keep safe from the protections from the virus. Uh, those in India, those in Italy and Spain, uh, those in every country around the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We continue to pray, Lord, for uh, Victory Ministries and uh, the Lutheran Church in Liberia. Uh, we give you thanks, Lord, that uh, with hours before my flight, uh, you redirected uh, my time and purposes and so I am not one of those people who is uh, anxiously sitting in a, a Casablanca airport 
uh, hoping and praying that I can find some way to get back to the United States. Uh, nonetheless, Lord, we are grieved that uh, the ministry and teaching that uh, we had prepared to do uh, with the church in Liberia has been postponed. Uh, we know, Lord, that many missionaries are being recalled. Many missionaries are being forced to shelter in place wherever they may be. Uh, many short-term mission projects have been postponed. Um, my own next trip to Jordan to work with refugees who are now in even uh, greater need and anxiety uh, at the Jordan-Syrian border uh, and in so many other places, Lord, there is so much need. We pray that uh, you would protect uh, all of the people that we share this planet with and that uh, as health and safety and uh, travel rules are lifted that you would redouble our commitment uh, through acts of charity and through teaching and equipping ministry leaders uh, that the whole world might know your love and compassion and your saving word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Lord, for all who suffer from any form of illness. Uh, we continue to have members of this congregation uh, recuperating from surgery, facing cancer, uh, dealing with uh, uh, chronic conditions that they have dealt with for many years. Uh, recuperating from injuries. Uh, so we pray, Lord, that even as their access to health care is more complicated, uh, that you would uh, protect and uh, give healing to all of our friends and neighbors who now have the added anxiety of uh, difficulty accessing health care. We also lift before you in the silence of our hearts uh, any of our friends or family about whose health we are especially concerned. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray together the prayer that our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Permit me to make a, a final announcement. Uh, typically in a worship service, there are other parts of the liturgy that we do. And uh, some churches uh, that, that have uh, slightly more advanced or were just quicker uh, to gear up systems for delivering online content, uh, they've... Uh, figured out a good way to deliver things like the Kyrie and the Hymn of Praise. But uh, since little old Brad here was blessed, blessed by God with zero musical ability, uh, we're not doing that and we're not pulling people into a room and haven't figured out a, a witty way yet to include some of those musical elements. Uh, but our music staff and our volunteers here do splice in pieces of music throughout the service and we are grateful for that. One thing that you obviously won't see us doing when it's just me alone here in the church uh, chapel is passing the collection plate. And uh, let me say just a brief word about that. Uh, most of the church's expenses here at St. Paul's uh, continue unabated. Uh, there was a special meeting this past week with the executive committee and the finance committee and uh, church Council on Sunday, the day this video uh, goes live, uh, has another special remote call-in Zoom meeting. And uh, we've gone literally line by line through uh, the entire budget and categorized, uh, for the moment at least, uh, high priority, secondary priority, third priority budget items, looked at what things that we can 
suspend or what uh, expenditures we can push off till later in the budget year. And this congregation is blessed to have some uh, cash reserves that it can fall back on. Uh, of course, those cash reserves were intended for uh, crises like this, but also preparation for uh, future building project and, and other uh, capital needs of the congregation. And so we, we don't want to uh, get all the way down to, uh, as Ezekiel envisioned, uh, just the bones uh, left in a pile. So if you are a member of St. Paul's, I'd remind you that there are two uh, primary channels by which you can continue to uh, offer your tithe for the work of the church. Uh, one of them is uh, by going to our website. We have had for a number of years a secure online giving option. Uh, you go to our website, uh, you can find that. And I believe that the church's MAD uh, website, our URL, will magically appear on screen so that if you don't remember the church's website, you can find it that way. And, uh, and you can do that as a one-time gift. You can set it up as recurring. You've got all of those options. And of course, so long as the U.S. Postal Service uh, continues to deliver mail, uh, we continue to have a secure system for receiving offerings. They go into a Dropbox safe that no one can access throughout the course of the week. And once a week, a team of uh, church council volunteers from multiple households comes in and we continue to observe all of our cash handling safety protocols. And uh, those funds are counted and taken uh, to uh, the bank for deposit then. So uh, you can continue to support uh, the, the financial operations of your church, either by doing it online or by dropping a check in the mail. If you are one of our distant uh, friends connected to the church, uh, we are not uh, shifting into televangelist fundraising mode. Uh, you do not need to send us a check just because uh, you happen to be listening to our service. We welcome that, of course. But particularly, if you're a member of another congregation that uh, simply hasn't, had, uh, hasn't been blessed with uh, the staff and volunteers and equipment to ramp up to an online service, or uh, if you're one of those folks who uh, in cabin fever mode or just because of the stress of the circumstance is seeking an additional service in addition to uh, that of your home congregation, I would simply remind you to continue your tithe to your home church wherever it is, and we are simply most happy to have you fellowshipping with us uh, across this uh, electronic delivery medium. Thank you all very much. Have a blessed week. Uh, we will have our uh, final midweek service, uh, which will uh, go live on Wednesday of the coming week. And then we will have uh, Holy Week. And on Holy Week, uh, we will have our Palm Sunday, Passion Sunday service. And then we will have a special service for Monday, Thursday, a special service for Good Friday, and of course, our celebratory Easter service.